Good day to you all and welcome, dear friends, to this ninth day of November. It is day 313 in our journey through the Bible. Hello to everyone out there. My name is Hunter and I am your brother. I'm somebody who's showing up with you every day to spend a little time together in the pages of the Bible. And we're going to let the Bible do what it does and direct our hearts to the one who is the living word of God. The one alone who has the words of life. Where are we going to go, said Peter. Well, we're coming to you, Lord. There's no other place we'd rather be. There's no other place that we need to be other than at your feet, hearing and receiving, learning to trust. So would you help us to do that now, even as we come to these pages in these books? Help us to see. We'll start in Job chapter 35 and 36, and then we'll go on to 1 Corinthians chapters 7 and 8. This is the word of the Lord. Job 35. Elihu reminds Job of God's justice. Then Elihu said, Do you think it is right for you to claim I am righteous before God? For you also ask, What's in it for me? What's the use of living a righteous life? I'll answer you and all your friends too. Look up into the sky and see the clouds above you. If you sin, how does that affect God? Even if you sin again and again, what effect will it have on Him? If you are good, is this some great gift to Him? What could you possibly give Him? No, your sins affect only people like yourself. And your good deeds also affect only humans. People cry out when they're oppressed. They groan beneath the power of the Almighty. Yet they don't ask, where is God my creator? The one who gives songs in the night. Where is the one who makes us smarter than the animals and wiser than the birds of the sky? And when they cry out, God does not answer because of their pride. But it is wrong to say God doesn't listen to say the Almighty isn't concerned. You say you can't see him, but he will bring justice if you will only wait. You say he does not respond to sinners with anger and is not greatly concerned about the wicked. But you're talking nonsense, Job. You have spoken like a fool. Job 36. Elihu continues speaking. Let me go on and I will show you the truth, for I have not finished defending God. I will present profound arguments for the righteousness of my Creator. I am telling you nothing but the truth, for I am a man of great knowledge. God is mighty, but He does not despise anyone. He is mighty in both power and understanding. He does not let the wicked live, but gives justice to the afflicted. He never takes His eyes off the innocent, but He sets them on thrones with kings and exalts them forever. If they are bound in chains and caught up in a web of trouble... He shows them the reason. He shows them their sins of pride. He gets their attention and commands that they turn from evil. If they listen and obey God, they will be blessed with prosperity throughout their lives. All their years will be pleasant. But if they refuse to listen to him, they will cross over the river of death, dying from lack of understanding. For the godless are full of resentment. Even when he punishes them, they refuse to cry out to him for help. They die when they are young after wasting their lives in immoral living, but by means of their suffering he rescues those who suffer, for he gets their attention through adversity. God is leading you away from danger, Job, to a place free from distress. He is setting your table with the best food, but you are obsessed with whether the godless will be judged. Don't worry, judgment and justice will be upheld, but watch out, or you may be seduced by wealth. Don't let yourself be bribed into sin. Could all your wealth or all your mighty efforts keep you from distress? Do not long for the cover of night, for that is when people will be destroyed. Be on guard. Turn back from evil, for God sent this suffering to keep you from a life of evil. Elihu reminds Job of God's power. Look, God is all-powerful. Who is a teacher like him? No one can tell him what to do or say to him, You've done wrong. Instead, glorify his mighty works. Sing songs of praise. Everyone has seen these things, though only from a distance. 
Look, God is greater than we can understand. His ears cannot be counted. He draws up the water vapor and then distills it into rain. The rain pours down from the clouds and everyone benefits. Who can understand the spreading of the clouds and the thunder that rolls forth from heaven? See how he spreads the lightning around him and how he lights up the depths of the sea. By these mighty acts he nourishes people, giving them food in abundance. He fills his hands with lightning bolts and hurls each at its target. The thunder announces his presence, and the storm announces his indignant anger. 1 Corinthians 7 Now regarding the questions you asked in your letter, yes, it is good to abstain from sexual relations, but because there is so much sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife, and each woman should have her own husband. The husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs, and the wife should fulfill her husband's needs. The wife gives authority over her body to her husband, and the husband gives authority over his body to his wife. Do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless both of you agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time, so you can give yourselves more completely to prayer. Afterward, you should come together again so that Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. But I wish everyone were single just like I am. Yet each person has a special gift from God, of one kind or another. So I say to those who aren't married and to widows, it's better to stay unmarried, just as I am. But if they can't control themselves, they should go ahead and marry. It's better to marry than to burn with lust. But for those who are married, I have a command that comes not from me, but from the Lord. A wife must not leave her husband. But if she does leave him, let her remain single or else be reconciled to him. And the husband must not leave his wife. Now I will speak to the rest of you. Though I do not have a direct command from the Lord, if a fellow believer has a wife who is not a believer and she's willing to continue living with him, he must not leave her. And if a believing woman has a husband who is not a believer and is willing to continue living with her, she must not leave him. For the believing wife brings holiness to her marriage, and the believing husband brings holiness to his marriage. Otherwise your children would not be holy. But now they are holy. But if the husband or wife who isn't a believer insists on leaving, let them go. In such cases, the believing husband or wife is no longer bound to the other. For God has called you to live in peace. Don't you wives realize that your husbands might be saved because of you? And don't you husbands realize that your wives might be saved because of you? Each of you should continue to live in whatever situation the Lord has placed you in. And remain as you were when God first called you. This is my rule for all the churches. For instance, a man who was circumcised before he became a believer should not try to reverse it. And the man who was uncircumcised when he became a believer should not try to be circumcised now. For it makes no difference whether or not a man has been circumcised. The important thing is to keep God's commandments. Yes, each of you should remain as you were when God called you. Are you a slave? Don't let that worry you. But if you get a chance to be free, take it. And remember, if you were a slave when the Lord called you, you are now free in the Lord. And if you were free when the Lord called you, you are now a slave of Christ. God paid a high price for you, so don't be enslaved by the world. Each of you, dear brothers and sisters, should remain as you were when God first called you. Now regarding your question about the young women who are not yet married, I do not have a command from the Lord for them, but the Lord in His mercy has given me wisdom that can be trusted, and I'll share it with you. Because of the present crisis, I think it best to remain as you are. If you have a wife, do not seek to end the marriage. If you do not have a wife, do not seek to get married. But if you do get married, it's not a sin. And if a young woman gets married, it's not a sin. However, those who get married at this time will have troubles, and I'm trying to spare you those problems. But let me say this, dear brothers and sisters, the time that remains is very short. So from now on, those with wives should not focus only on their marriage. Those who weep or who rejoice or who buy things should not be absorbed by their weeping or their joy or their possessions. Those who use the things of the world should not become attached to them. For this world as we know it will soon pass away. I want you to be free from the concerns of this life. An unmarried man can spend his time doing the Lord's work and thinking how to please Him. 
But a married man has to think about his earthly responsibilities and how to please his wife. His interests are divided. In the same way, a woman who is no longer married or has never been married can be devoted to the Lord and holy in body and in spirit. But a married woman has to think about her earthly responsibilities and how to please her husband. I am saying this for your benefit, not to place restrictions on you. I want you to do whatever will help you serve the Lord best, with as few distractions as possible. But if a man thinks that he's treating his fiancée improperly, or will inevitably give in to his passion, let him marry her as he wishes. It's not a sin. But if he has decided firmly not to marry, and there's no urgency, and he can control his passion, he does well not to marry. So the person who marries his fiancée does well, and the person who doesn't marry does even better. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. If her husband dies, she's free to marry anyone she wishes, but only if he loves the Lord. But in my opinion, it would be better for her to stay single. And I think I'm giving you counsel from God's Spirit when I say this. 1 Corinthians 8 Now regarding your question about food that has been offered to idols, yes, we know that we all have knowledge about this issue. But while knowledge makes us feel important, it is love that strengthens the church. Anyone who claims to know all the answers doesn't really know very much. But the person who loves God is the one whom God recognizes. So what about eating meat that has been offered to idols? Well, we all know that an idol is not really a god and that there's only one god. There may be so-called gods both in heaven and on earth. And some people actually worship many gods and many lords. But for us, there is one God, the Father, by whom all things were created and for whom we live. And there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things were created and through whom we live. However, not all believers know this. Some are accustomed to thinking of idols as being real. So when they eat meat that has been offered to idols... They think of it as the worship of real gods, and their weak consciences are violated. It's true that we can't win God's approval by what we eat. We don't lose anything if we don't eat it, and we don't gain anything if we do. But you must be careful so that your freedom does not cause others with a weaker conscience to stumble. For if others see you with your great superior knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, won't they be encouraged to violate their conscience by eating food that has been offered to an idol? So because of your superior knowledge, a weak believer for whom Christ died will be destroyed. And when you sin against another believer by encouraging them to do something they believe is wrong, you are sinning against Christ. So if what I eat causes another believer to sin, I will never eat meat again as long as I live, for I don't want to cause another believer to stumble. And now may our Lord who keeps us from stumbling. May he now give his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Love is the truest test of what we really know. Paul says something very interesting in verse 6. He writes what sounds like some catechismal formula a theological statement or tenet of orthodoxy that every believer should know. He says this, There is one God, the Father by whom all things were created, and for whom we live, and there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things were created, and through whom we live. And then he says this, However, not all believers know this. What? They don't know? You'd think they should know. I mean, shouldn't they know that there is only one God and one Lord Jesus? I mean, how can we even call them believers? (laughs) And yet Paul does. Paul seems to be suggesting quite clearly here that their inclusion into the community was not contingent on what they know. 
Instead, their inclusion into the community was based on being known. And the one who knows them is love. And he has drawn them into his life even though they don't seem to know the most basic tenets of that life or faith. This might be a problem for many teachers of the faith today. If you don't know the right things and say the right things and pray the right things, you're not in. In fact, you're out. But this was not a problem for Paul because Paul knew that God is love. And love gives itself to those who don't know. Love gives himself to all, as a matter of fact. And Paul is saying, let love be your guide. Let love direct your actions. Respond to those who don't know what they should know in love. Love lays down itself, gives up its privileges for the sake of others, So you do the same, says Paul. Love will be our catechism. Love will instruct us in all that we need to know in God's time. So let love be our first concern. And then let's see what God will do. That's the prayer that I have for my own soul. That's the prayer that I have for my family, for my wife and my daughters and my son. And that's the prayer that I have for you. May it be so. Well, dear ones, we've done it again. We've spent a perfectly good 20 minutes here in the pages of the Bible. You have invested time into your soul. Jesus said, is anything more valuable than your soul? So you've done well in investing this time today, making it a part of your day-to-day, making it a part of your ordinary. That, my friend, is so good. Well, hey, before I let y'all go, I just want to send a shout out to some folks out there that are making this goodness possible. These are our partners. These are the folks that have given so that the podcast can do and be what it is. So a big thank you and a big shout out to Kathy Farnham, Charlie Jones, Marie Mueller, Amanda Lundberg, Jeff and Lynn Ostrowski, Natalie Thurman, and Tom and Fran Clausen. Blessings to you, my sisters and my brothers, my co-workers in this good work of the Lord blessings to you all. And if you're listening to this and you'd like to partner with us, that is so needed and so appreciated. All you have to do is head on over to the webpage, dailyradiobible.com, click on that donate link, and you'll be on your way. Well, I'm going to be on my way now, but what do you say we all show up again here tomorrow and we'll get to work again. Until that time, let's go forward in God's joy. Let's let his joy be our strength and let us always remember this that you are loved. No doubt about that. Alrighty, I'll talk to you again tomorrow. You guys take care. Bye-bye.